I'm Jim Kircher, and Living St. Louis continues its summer of the 20th century with episodes from decades. This one brings us to St. Louis in the 1940s. It's not just a time of war. Just as important, it's a time of post-war. This time on Decades, the 1940s. Wartime means a revitalized economy, a growing population, and new ways of getting the job done. When it's over, there is stability, prosperity, and the old ways just aren't coming back. Decades was a co-production of the Missouri History Museum and the Nine Network of Public Media. When we produced the Decades series in the late 1990s, it was clear that every decade was a decade of change. But there's nothing quite like the 1940s. It divides the 20th century into pre-war and post-war. That's true for St. Louis, it's true for the country, it's true for the lives of the people who lived through it. When the new decade began, 18-year-old Harry Dallas was still in the Civilian Conservation Corps with other Depression-era kids working for the government for food, lodging, and money to send home. He couldn't have hoped or imagined that 10 years later he'd be living in a new suburban house watching television. But the changes were already happening. America in 1940 wasn't at war yet, but American industry was, supplying Britain and the Soviet Union in their fight with Germany. So when Harry got out of the CCC, he didn't have to look for work. The work came looking for him. So then I had a, a gentleman that came down from St. Louis into Murfreesboro, and he was looking for young fellows to work in the defense plants in St. Louis, and uh, hauled us up here in his car found us a place to stay out on Natural Bridge, and he got us all a job at Emerson Electric. The Depression was over. This wasn't just a recovery. The defense contracts coming out of Washington turned St. Louis into a boom town. And after the attack on Pearl Harbor, America fully mobilized its military and its economy. In St. Louis, the steel mills, the airplane factories like Curtis Wright and the brand new McDonnell aircraft, the auto and electronics plants, the garment and shoe factories, the food processors, the university research labs, they all had orders to fill. St. Louis generated 170,000 new manufacturing jobs during the war. The war itself was, a, was a, an, event of, an event of almost incalculable importance, uh, not only because of its size and its scope, but because it unleashed an unsuspected uh, economic and technological potential. Uh, during World War II, the American economy grew uh, nearly 50 percent. This is total war, everybody's war. Into the pockets of Americans, this war production is pouring a hundred million dollars a day. People were making money again, but now there wasn't much on the shelves to buy. The factories were making things for the war, not for consumers. Gasoline was rationed and people were packing the streetcars and buses. They were standing in line with coupons for their monthly allowance of meat, sugar, and cigarettes. Scrap metal and old rubber tires, even nylon stockings were collected to be recycled into war products. St. Louisans practiced air raid drills and joined the drives to put their savings behind the war effort. If we are to win this war, Every penny that can be spared must go into war saving stamps and bonds. That's why you see the Minutemen wherever you turn. Americans began the war with huge losses at Pearl Harbor, and they needed hopeful news, victories, and heroes. And they got one. A young man who grew up in St. Louis, a Navy fighter pilot named Butch O'Hare, just a few months into the war, he shot down five Japanese planes in one day, 
becoming the Navy's first ace and one of the war's first real heroes. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor, toured the country, and was given a big parade in St. Louis. The next year, back in combat, his plane was shot down over the Pacific, and Butch O'Hare's body was never found. That same year, 1943, St. Louis's own mayor and several business and civic leaders lost their lives while promoting the war effort on the home front. At Lambert Field, they climbed aboard a military glider that was being built here by Robertson Aircraft. These gliders would be used in the Normandy invasion to drop troops and equipment behind enemy lines. But on this Sunday morning demonstration flight, a wing snapped, and the glider plunged straight to the ground in front of a crowd of spectators, killing all 10 people on board including Mayor William D. Becker. The war had its impact at home, but most of the many changes did not happen with a crash. There were new people, new jobs, new opportunities, a newly vibrant life in a crowded city working round the clock. Very different wartime experiences than what Harry Dallas was going through on a Navy ship somewhere in the Pacific. See, I was gone for almost four years. And uh, I don't know what happened in the United States in those times. I mean, they talk about sugar rationing and gasoline rationing and tire rationing. I know nothing about that because I wasn't here. I was gone. All I knew about was what my mother wrote me. That, that was it. For all that they were missing back home, servicemen always managed to find out the baseball scores. It was decided early in the war not to cancel professional baseball, a move perhaps more important in St. Louis than any other city, and more important to the St. Louis Browns than any other team. The Browns had never won the pennant, but in 1944, perhaps because many of the best athletes were away at war, the lovable losers were the American League champions and faced the Cardinals in the only all St. Louis World Series ever played. As expected, the Cardinals won the series, four games to two. But no matter where they were in the fall of 44, the boys from St. Louis had something to cheer about. St. Louis officials and planners started the decade with concerns about the city's future. They looked ahead and saw population declining and housing deteriorating. They saw the county growing and building. Then the war brought a sudden influx of people. With so many new jobs and so many young men leaving for military service, people streamed into the city from the rural areas and from the south, whites and blacks, and still more workers were needed. That meant the old ways of doing things would have to change. As an airplane worker, I ask all of you to help support our armed forces. Women were seen as the untapped resource, and the government now promoted and encouraged the image of the female factory worker. She was dubbed Rosie the Riveter, patriotic but retaining her traditional femininity. What I think is a misconception about the Rosie the Riveter image is that Rosie never worked before. And I think uh, what really happens is that in World War II, you see the women who move into the defense jobs, the kind of Rosie the Riveter jobs, are people who are already working. They're not new to the workforce, but they're moving out of traditional women's work into those jobs. And then as they make that transition, they, they leave open other jobs that then tend to be filled by women who are newer, newer to the workforce. Things were changing for African Americans as well. A lot of black men were being hired into skilled, high-paying jobs for the first time. But they were often segregated, and at some plants, they weren't hired at all. But here and around the country, blacks were demanding better treatment in hiring and pay. And the National March on Washington movement threatened a massive protest in the U.S. Capitol if things didn't change and President Franklin Roosevelt changed them, issuing an executive order ending discrimination in the national defense industry. It was put to the test in St. Louis at U.S. Cartridge on North Goodfellow, where 35,000 people were working at the country's largest small arms plant. 
After complaints about discrimination, the new Fair Employment Practices Committee came in from Washington to straighten things out. It was a powerful weapon civil rights activists had never had before. They certainly didn't have the support of the government. And I think this is the difference, that there was a climate developing then, which gave a dimension to the struggle which we never had before. That is to say, we had somebody on our side other than ourselves and, the, and those who were a part of our structure. The presidential order, though, didn't affect the country's biggest employer, the armed forces themselves. As America battled racist regimes, its own army and navy remained segregated. It was one thing for a boy like Ted McMillian to grow up in segregated neighborhoods and schools in St. Louis. It was another for the man in a U.S. Army lieutenant's uniform to be forced to change to a blacks-only car when his train crossed into Arkansas. I didn't really think that uh, anything was going to change until after I'd been into the Army and the war, and I just figured then at that time that if we could fight for the country, then we should have a right to come back and that things uh, would at least ameliorate and change to somewhat, uh, somewhat. I didn't know how great the change would be. In March of 1945, Lieutenant McMillian, a signal corpsman, was directing traffic across the Remagen Bridge over the Rhine River. In one of the most important battles of the war, Americans had taken the bridge, which sent them into the heart of Germany and they were able to get all kind of tanks, heavy ammunition and troops. And I'm quite sure they'd shorten the war anywhere from eight to nine months because all that heavy equipment we were able to get across. At the Rhine River, the young lieutenant was unaware that back home in St. Louis, a very different kind of bridge had been crossed and it would change his life. At Friday Mass at the St. Louis University College Church in February of 44, Father Claude Heidhouse called for the university to begin admitting Negro students. He said communists and Muslims were welcoming people of all races, while many who called themselves Christians refused to do so. University President Father Patrick Holleran was already exploring the question of admitting blacks and the possibility that such a move might prompt white students to leave. Whitehouse, who was the head of university public relations, made sure his remarks made it into the newspapers the next day. It is probable Whitehouse was acting on his own. He would later be disciplined after another run-in with the administration. But that spring, when most state and private colleges were still for whites only, the Jesuit University accepted its first black students. The St. Louis American called it one of the most important steps in race relations in Missouri since the abolition of slavery. The fact that, that St. Louis, the city, was a slave owner's and slave's city only a lifetime earlier, I, I think heightens the drama of all this. I mean, to, to desegregate any institution uh, is significant. To desegregate an institution that was founded during the time of slaves and founded uh, by Jesuits who at one point owned slaves themselves, uh, to open that up while there are still people living who were slaves in 1944, who remember that, it, it, that's, that is quite a, an amazing uh, transformation. There were also those who were pushing for the local parochial schools to take the lead in ending segregation, but they were under the Archbishop, John Glennon, who had been leading the St. Louis Archdiocese since the days of the World's Fair. He'd accomplished many things in those four decades, but his attitudes on race had been formed in the 19th century and he would not integrate the parochial schools. It was just something he could not handle, that's all. He could not handle it. He had, uh, you know, if for, for 30 years, nobody ever tells you you're doing anything wrong. It's awful hard to realize you are doing something wrong, see. And uh, Cardinal Glennon did a lot of good things. They should have had some retirement system, which they didn't until uh, the time of Pope John. The Glennon era lasted nearly the whole first half of the 20th century, and it came to an end in 1946. Glennon flew to Rome to be elevated to cardinal by Pope Pius XII. At age 83, he became the church's second oldest cardinal, but the long trip took its toll on his health. 
on the way back from Rome while visiting Ireland where he had been born, raised, and trained for the priesthood, John Cardinal Glennon became ill and died in Dublin. On his deathbed he was asked if he wanted to be buried in his native Ireland. His answer was, I belong to St. Louis. Glennon's body was returned to the city where thousands of people lined up to pay their final respects. He was interred in the new cathedral, the church that he had built for St. Louis. Pope Pius named the new Archbishop of St. Louis and it was a surprise to many, Joseph Ritter. Ritter had integrated the parochial schools in Indianapolis in the 30s and the new Archbishop did the same when he came to St. Louis. When he first came, somebody said, uh, Father, that's the black church here in West Pine. He said, oh no, no, we don't have black churches. We have only Catholic churches. So people knew there was going to be a change. In June of 1944, Allied troops invaded Europe at Normandy. Soviet forces were driving from the east and eventually, at a terrible cost, they would crush the German forces between them. The following spring, they would meet at the Elbe River. All that was left was for the Red Army to fight its way to Hitler's bunker in the heart of Berlin. And while the American generals waited outside the capital for the news, a St. Louis woman was already there, writing it. The air is heavy with smoke. Everywhere around us is the clatter of small arms fire. Russian artillery is pouring an almost constant barrage in the heart of the city. Before the war, Virginia Irwin had been a feature writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. She went to London in 43 to work for the Red Cross, and then after D-Day, she followed the troops as a war correspondent. When the Americans stopped at the Elba River, she managed to keep going. Irwin and another correspondent talked an army sergeant into a daring nighttime jeep drive through no man's land all the way to Berlin, where Soviet troops were still battling through the city block by block. The arrival of three Americans in Berlin was the signal for the Russians to break out their best vodka and toss a terrific banquet in our honor. I have danced with at least a dozen Russians of various rank and degrees of Terpsichorean ability. When the American army caught up to her, they yanked her credentials. But these first American eyewitness accounts from Berlin made it to the front page of the Post-Dispatch along with the news that the war in Europe was over. But even as the city celebrated VE Day, the post-war world was shaping up. The division of Germany and its capital would bring crisis and decades of tension. That August, the U.S. ended the war with Japan with a new secret weapon whose destructive power shocked the world. But for those preparing to invade Japan, there was joy and relief. They were still alive and they were going home. It was the end of the long struggle and the beginning of a new era defined by Berlin and Hiroshima. The world that they were coming back to wouldn't spring back into the, into the mold of the 20s or the 30s or, or anything within memory. In fact, it would be very different. When the war ended, McDonnell Aircraft was working on a new jet plane, the Phantom, but it was experimental and there were no big production orders. America was getting out of the war business as fast as it could. There were huge layoffs at the small arms plant. Another 11,000 jobs were lost when the biggest aircraft company, Curtis Wright, simply closed up shop in St. Louis. All this as servicemen were flooding back into the job market. To ease the transition, the GI Bill guaranteed veterans $20 a week for up to a year. The great fear, of course, was that there would be a recession, if not a depression, as followed World War I. So it was a, it was, there was a transition. It was not easy, though it certainly was easy compared to what the population of the rest of the world was suffering. It did not involve massive unemployment. It involved a shortage of goods and inflation that made life very tight for a lot of people for a, for a considerable time. But perhaps the most frustrating thing of all for these veterans 
there was no place to live. Things had gotten so crowded with defense and government workers that temporary housing had to be erected near the factories during the war. Veterans wanting to get on with their lives and their marriages and start families were stuck living at home with their parents or packed into tiny apartments and rooming houses. If the housing shortage was bad for St. Louis in general, it was impossible for African Americans. The growing black population was still confined to certain neighborhoods by a wall of paper, legal documents called restrictive covenants, which limited property ownership in certain areas to whites only. It was done all over the country to segregate housing, and it was legal. But that, too, would change in this decade after a black family named Shelley moved into this house at 4600 Labity, on a block that was supposed to be just for whites. Their fight to stay would lead to a landmark civil rights decision. I sat at our breakfast table every morning and listened to Shelley versus Kramer for about three years, I think. Because Margaret Bush Wilson's parents were active in the local NAACP, and her father was one of the realtors involved in the Shelley case. It was not set up to be a test case at all. Shelley's just wanted a place to live. It was just that simple. They had come from Mississippi. They had lots of children. And they were living with relatives. In this climate, when St. Louis, like many of these cities, was overcrowded in a section of the city where blacks could live. St. Louis attorney George Vaughn took Shelley versus Kramer all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. NAACP attorney Thurgood Marshall joined Vaughn in arguing the case, and they won. The court said racial restrictions on property ownership were unenforceable. The Shelleys had broken through the wall. Here in St. Louis, for the first time, our people could go outside Taylor Avenue and buy a house, <laughs> go beyond Natural Ridge and buy a house, and go past Del Mar and buy a house. <laughs> it, we were just that contained. So in that sense, I think it had enormous impact. But well into the 1950s, the newspaper real estate ads reflected the reality of where people could and could not live, and the public schools remained legally segregated. In the immediate post-war years, race was not the main issue in housing. It was supply and demand. Home building picked up in the city, but as always, the population was moving west. St. Louis County's growth had been outpacing the city since the 1920s, and now there was an explosion in suburban development. Keep in mind that the post-war expansion was not the same thing as the sprawl that we're experiencing today. There was really a substantial increase in population. Uh, between 1940 and 1950, St. Louis County gained 50 percent in population, and at the same time, the city of St. Louis gained another 40,000 people. So there was increase everywhere, not just uh, flight from the city. Developer Charles Vaderot was turning open fields along St. Charles Rock Road into curved streets lined with two- and three-bedroom homes, the brand-new city of St. Anne. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere. There were already thousands of jobs at factories near the airport, at Emerson Electric in Ferguson, and the new Ford plant in Hazelwood. And Vaderot wasn't building for the factory bosses. These homes were priced for the workers and tradesmen and their families, people who had never had a chance to own a home. The developers had a partner in all of this, the U.S. government, through GI Bill home loans, was helping to change the American landscape and redefine the American dream. I did get a GI loan for my first house, yeah. I had to pay $300 down, I think, for the first house uh, out in Edmondson, and it was a GI loan. Mm -hmm. And my payments, I think, were $64 a month. <laughs> What the GI Bill did for home ownership, it did for college education. St. Louis University had to put up temporary classrooms to handle the overflow. One of its new law students would go on to become a federal judge. He still could not go to the University of Missouri, but this door had been opened and others would follow. And most of us was war vet veterans and we were sharing experiences, talking about different times. And uh, we got to be very good friends. We had a kind of a unity among us. And uh, I, don't, 
I don't remember any racial incident. New opportunities, new homes, families, educations. The consumer economy was booming again. There were cars and refrigerators, and in 1947, television. But the new technology, the new prosperity, the new world, emerged only after the long, dark years of depression and war. I lost my childhood. A lot of people nowadays, you know, they get, get out of school, go to college, and they have their car, and they have all of this, and, and they're free to do as they choose for the first five or six years. We didn't have that. And all the, all the people in my age group, we went through that. So it was, uh, it was one of those things that happened. And it's, that's the way it was. America emerged from World War II the richest and most powerful country in the world, and that would be a mixed blessing. In 1950, Harry Dallas was married and raising a daughter in a little suburban house with a picket fence. Across the street at the airport, McDonnell Aircraft was turning out fighter jets, heading off to Korea and the Cold War. No one ever really leaves the past behind, and the people who lived through the 40s would build their lives based on their experiences, their stories, their interpretations of a decade that shook the world with aftershocks that we can still detect today. For decades, I'm Jim Kircher. Thank you.